together. Welcome tonight to our workshop. This is in preparation for the City Nature Challenge taking place worldwide. And the Friends of the Saskatoon Afforestation Area are hosts for the City Nature Challenge taking place in Saskatoon and area April 29th to May 2nd. Tonight we're going to be looking at making identifications on a naturalist. We will begin with the traditional treaty land acknowledgements. The Elf Forest Station areas are situated in the West Swale, Yorath Island Glacial Spillway, a sacred site in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. The City of Saskatoon and the area of the City Nature Challenge is also taking place on Treaty 6 lands. Those who entered into Treaty 6 are the Nahiawak, Cree, Nakawe, Salto, and the Yankton and Yankatone Nakoda people. May our relationships with the land, standing peoples, forests, and waters teach us to honor and respect the past and invite us to move forward in harmony. May we all come together as friends to find inspiration and guidance from histories, languages, and cultures which broaden our understanding and community collaboration for the present and for the future. The Friends of the Saskatoon Outforestation Areas are hosting the very first City Nature Challenge for the City of Saskatoon and area. As mentioned, we are a non-profit environmental charity formed to care for the 326-acre Richard St. Barb Baker Outforestation Area and the 148-acre George Jenner River National Park in Saskatoon. We were advised to create a data inventory by the City of Saskatoon and the Miwasan. And so, in any season and at any time of the day, we used our naturalists to contribute to the ecological assessment for future planning. Noxious invasives were found and reported, as well as over 24 species at risk. We want to share this adventure of using our naturalists with people in Saskatoon and surrounding area and around the world. It's a fun, friendly competition with a chance to play cities and nature on the world stage. This is the location of where the afforestation areas are located on the very southwest outskirts of Saskatoon inside of city limits. Maybe we'll see you out there one day. So during this session on iNaturalist identifications, what would you need to make an identification? You would need your computer opened up to iNaturalist and you are signed in with your username. To make identifications for Saskatoon and area, you would go to settings and turn it to iNaturalist.ca and that will help the artificial intelligence resident on iNaturalist come up with a better match for species when you're looking at the various organisms in front of you. If you were going to try to do identifications in Paris, France, you would change it to iNaturalist for France. And if you were going to tackle some identifications in Florida or California, you would use the iNaturalist.usa setting. There are quite a few different countries um, on iNaturalist and it would be good to find out which country you'd like to key in on when you're making your observations. And what is in this particular session? Some confidence in adding identifications and especially flipping some unknowns and we'll provide some examples. This is not really a post-secondary course in using a dichotomous or taxonomic key. However, we will cover some basic taxonomy uh, such as the iNaturalist tree, what kingdoms are, and how to use the artificial intelligence on iNaturalist. We are all very good at coming to genus level usually because from a very young age, we can look at a picture book, even as a toddler and know the difference between cows and pigs and plants and animals. And that's all very handy, especially when it comes to doing identifications on iNaturalist. And here we'll be talking about how to differentiate when we should stay at genus level or above and when we should put it in for species level. We will discuss the iNaturalist data quality assessment, the DQA, and we'll learn how to add an ID and when to be bold and when to add an ID, even if you're not a specialist scientist. The iNaturalist community is varied. It includes those who know little to nothing about nature, self-taught people who have developed a certain amount of expertise, serious students and specialists doing scientific research. So it's amazing mix. So to begin with, try to use iNaturalist just to get used to it a little bit. Find the iNaturalist app on the Apple Store or on Google Play for your smartphone. 
make a few observations around you. Click on what did you see to see iNaturalist suggestions and learn about computer vision technology and the power of iNaturalist. It's easy as one, two, three. Snap a picture, share it online, and then the identifications come. So on your smartphone, the screen will look something like this. You will see in this area all the different photographs you have taken using iNaturalist. And let's say you're going to take a picture of a plant. You would take a picture of the flower. You'd click on this plus sign, stay at the same organism, and take a picture of the bottom of the flower or the calyx. Then you click on the plus sign, take a picture of the top side of the leaf, click on the plus sign, take a picture of the bottom side of the leaf, click on the plus sign again, take a picture of the entire plant, click on the plus sign again, and take a picture of the habitat where the flower is growing. All these things help people that come around later to try to identify your flower. As much as possible, try to take as many images of your observation when it comes to animals and insects and uh, things like that even though maybe birds will fly away before you get too many pictures or maybe the bumblebee will fly off to another flower but try to take as many pictures of you can as you can because sometimes for identification an insect might need a particular stripe or a particular view and the more pictures you can take the better it is to come to the species level so here we have it again want to practice Give iNaturalist a try. The City Nature Challenge is taking place April 29th to May 2nd. The observation phase is May 3rd to May 8th, and the winners across the world are announced on May 9th. Uh, use iNaturalist anytime on your own. For a meetup here in Saskatoon, just email us at friendsafforestation at gmail.com, and we would love to come out and meet your team and connect with nature. So here's a screen to learn about identifications. So for the City Nature Challenge, we would type in under play Saskatoon area, and then you would choose the category if you so desire. You can click this button, this dotted leaf with a question mark, and click here for needs ID for those unknowns that need to be flipped. These were uploaded onto iNaturalist without any comments or any identification at all. Or else if you particularly like birds or frogs or insects or plants, you can check, choose on any of those categories if those are your speciality. And that would be absolutely fantastic. So there's quite a few different um, things to click on for different days and different times that you come online on iNaturalist to make identifications. So this page here on iNaturalist is very handy. It's tells how to proceed with etiquette on iNaturalist. And it really does encourage us all to be bold and please help with identification. And this short workshop will show you how. So this is an introduction to the iNaturalist automated species identification. So here someone has uploaded this beautiful little yellow flower. And then when they click on, what did you see? The iNaturalist Automated Species Identification suggests that they think it's in this genus of uh, the slipper orchids. And then it keeps on going and it says, well, it could be one of these species within the slipper orchid genus as well. And this list actually scrolls down a little bit longer as well. So this view button here allows you to bring up all the photographs on iNaturalist that have been uploaded for the genus of slipper orchid as well as for this individual species and so on. So you can compare this observation to all these different pictures that come up and then you can agree. You can click on one of these if this observation matches visually to any of these ones. If you're not sure about species level, it's quite okay to stay with genus level and let a specialist scientist come along later and say, oh, I think this kind of looks like this species. Unless you have some time to delve into a taxonomic key, or it's even fun to type in some of these species into something like a search engine like Google or Bing or something and see what they come up with for different indicators and things to look for to come to species level. And there's even a few taxonomic keys online. Here in this next observation, we see that this organism is held in front of a hand. 
And that is a wonderful way to give scale to something that's being photographed in the field. You can use your hand, you can place a coin in the picture, you could even take a tape measure in your pocket. Now then, iNaturalist looks at this observation and figures this organism belongs to the genus of true sedges. They're pretty sure. So you can click on this view button and look at all the pictures of true sedges on iNaturalist and see if you agree if there's a match. Here are also some other images of species level that belongs to tree, tree sedges. So once again, you can click on view and look at pictures that just belong to these species. It's fine if you just agree with iNaturalist on tree sedges, or if you just don't think that's a very good match at all. It's all right if you look at the picture and go, well, I'm more comfortable at saying this is a plant and just stay at that level. And that's perfectly fine too. So when you come to do an identification on iNaturalist, anyone at all can make an identification to an observation. You don't even have to know which species. There is a wonderful networking on iNaturalist and a community ID system. And it will change the observation of the organism from unknown to perhaps casual grade. Um, needs ID is also another word for unknown or up to research grade, which is genus and species level. So here for this, um, Whoopsie, here for this amazing caterpillar, the first identification in the field thought that this caterpillar might evolve and morph into a butterfly or a moth. So they put in that it belonged to the order of Lepidoptera. The next person came around to make an identification and they used, as we can tell from this icon, the computer vision technology. And they clicked on compare and they figured yes, we do think that it belongs to the Owlet Moths and Allies family. Then the next person came along to do an identification. And here, if you click on their username, read their bio, if it's posted. Perhaps they are a specialist or an entomologist. And that gives you a little bit more credence into maybe their suggestion that it belongs to the Tiger Moth tribe, that it, it could be a, a better match. And here you can keep, again, click on compare and you can keep on going with a closer and closer, more narrowed in identification for this little caterpillar. And at any time you can agree as you go along. This next person brought it from tribe level to genus level. And once again, you can compare it here and then mark agree if you agree or just go with a higher level. It's a wonderful way to learn and go down in the taxonomic key with different people in the iNaturalist crowdsourcing network. So here we have a butterfly. Online you have the ability to look at the taxon and here, or the about, or the map, or similar species. So for every single thing online, they have this species page. So we can see the various pictures and here we see the adult, stage, cocoon, caterpillar, and we can click view more. We find out who's the top observer for that particular organism, the top identifier of that organism, when it was last viewed on and uploaded into iNaturalist, and how many observations worldwide have been uploaded and identified for monarch butterfly. This is the taxon page. So if you click on similar species, you'll get a page up similar to this one. So you can compare the photograph that the observer made of the organism with all these various different butterflies. These are commonly mistaken as a monarch butterfly and you can kind of see why with the similar colorings and it could be that some of these butterflies have a caterpillar that is often confused with the monarch butterfly. So this is a very handy page to check into if you want to get it closer on your identification. This page is the shows the taxonomic key for the monarch butterfly and it also shows names in other languages and here is the latin name or the taxonomic names so if you don't want to go all the way to species level on the monarch butterfly you can pick something higher as we saw with our caterpillar earlier they chose that it belonged to the order of lepidoptera or butterflies and moths you can choose anything you want if you can pick insects or arthropods or animals, whatever you feel comfortable with how far you've come in your research. And that's perfectly fine and it all helps 
if you just put something in, it helps to call a specialist to this area. Um, if someone is specializing in frogs, they might not want to come along to a butterfly um, identification. And so by keying in just a little bit of information, it brings those specialists to these observations and it just helps out getting it to identification level of species a little bit quicker. When you're identifying, these are the keyboard shortcuts and they just help to speed it up for the process for your success. You can click the arrow keys to navigate between the various observations you want to look at. The eye goes into the identification form and see the comment form. And um, if you click Z, you can quite easily mark it as captive or cultivated, where captive refers to maybe a your pet, a, a domesticated dog or kitty cat, or maybe cultivated is something like the lettuce or your tomatoes in the garden that you're looking at. So Z helps you to mark it as something that's not native to the area. Um, also, we kind of mentioned this icon before. This little icon mentions that the identification was made using iNaturalist's computer vision technology. This screen here would be the identification form. And on iNaturalist, there's a form just below here if you want to make a comment about perhaps a feature on this particular organism that you use to come to that particular identification. For instance, if I was going to identify a wild rose in Saskatchewan, of which there are three species, it is wonderful to look at the five petaled pink flowers of our wild roses. However, the flower bloom does not really help to go down and down to species level on the taxonomic key. What you need for wild roses is to have a picture of the stem and the bristles on the stem. So that's where it comes in handy to have people that are observing in the field, taking many, many pictures. If they have just submitted the top of the flower and you see these wonderful five petaled pink flowers, pretty much you can only go to genus level and call it a wild rose, genus rosa. But if they have a little bit more information, such as the bristles on the stem, you can usually get it to species level. So that's also something identifiers need to know that every once in a while it just doesn't go to species level with the photographs that are submitted online. So what is a verifiable observation? Well, you need to know that and see a photograph or a sound recording online from the observer. You need to see that the observer has given permissions to record the GPS location and that the iNaturalist app was allowed to add the date and time. Those three things help to make it a verifiable observation where people can go back and check in that area if they wanted to do follow-up or more scientific research in the area. Something is called an unknown. If someone has uploaded an observation on their smartphone in the field and there is a photo or a sound recording, but for some reason the observer just didn't make any comments as to what their photographs could be. So even if the observer has uploaded a sound recording or a photo, it is very handy for people making identifications to put something in for the identification. Even if it is just a plant or an animal, then the observation changes from an unknown to casual level. This is part of the iNaturalist Data Quality Assessment or DQA. So there are some reasons on iNaturalist why there might be unknowns. And sometimes they come to a category called state of matter of life. There are certain fungi and mush like mushrooms that just cannot be identified without using a microscope. So even if you take a lot of pictures with your smartphone, without a microscope, they just can't get to species level. That being said, not all mushrooms are like that, and there are quite a few mushrooms that have come to species level on iNaturalist. Some other um, organisms that do need a microscope might be things like algae or cyanobacteria or slime molds. Also, a few insects also need a microscopic examination. And so these things might end up not being able to get to species level ever. There is another way of being an identifier on iNaturalist, and that is to make a comment rather than to proceed with a full identification. 
It is very helpful to comment, especially if identifying from another country. Genus level may certainly be similar from country to country, but species may differ in their naming just because they differ a little bit because of the habitat where they exist in. So mentioning that it looks like something in this genus and if, if I was identifying it here, I would say it's this species and just leave it that species in the comment for other people to say that live there locally, if they agree or not. Also, observers can also add comments in, in the comment field. And if identifiers read the comments from the observers, that also helps because perhaps if the bird has flown away or the snake is too fast, it might result in a bit of a blurry picture. And so it might help to just read what the observer says in their comment section. Also, if you just give it a very coarse identification like plants or fungi, it does call on various specialist scientists to come along and give it just another look. There is another data quality assessment on iNaturalist called Research Grade. It needs five things on the observation, such as the actual evidence of the observation in the form of a picture or a sound recording. It needs to be identified all the way with the genus and the species level recorded under community collaboration. It needs to show the GPS location of where it was found, the time and date of when it was seen, and the iNaturalist username of who saw it. Also, to make it to research grade, there needs to be two-thirds consensus by the identification community agreeing on the species identification. If, for instance, an observation has eight people that have come to visit to identify that particular organism, and all the way along, eight people have agreed that it's this species, and so it does go to research grade, and then if the ninth person that comes along says, whoa, hold the bus, we don't think it's that species at all. This is what I think for species level. This is the reason why I think it's a different species. And then the process starts all over with a new conversation about whether or not it should be the first species mentioned by the first eight people, whether or not this ninth person coming along is correct on the species, or maybe it's even yet a third species. So the conversation begins and it's a lot of fun to delve into a little bit further what the species level might be for that organism. That's all part of the data quality assessment process. So why in the world are there so many unknowns? There are so many reasons. Perhaps there was a poor smartphone connection in the field for the observer. Perhaps they wanted to get home and type in their identifications on the computer rather than on the smartphone when they were in the field, and they just haven't got back to the computer yet. Perhaps it was very cold out, and smartphones don't really like gloves and mittens, and maybe the observer didn't want to take off their gloves and mittens too often. It could be that they were running out of batteries in the field, and it could be that there was just too many organisms and too little time. And the person out in the field making their observations of organisms went from one organism, uploaded it to iNaturalist, went to the next organism, uploaded it to iNaturalist, and kept doing that, thinking that they still had lots of time in the afternoon to follow up with the identifications. Then when they got back home, life happened. And they had to make supper and feed the kids and attend meetings. And they didn't get back to do the identification as quickly as they had hoped. So their observations for that day remained as unknowns. And, and sometimes that is just fine because the data is still there and other people can come along and help out with the identifications, especially if the photo and the sound recording are there attached to the organism. And perhaps someone went out in the field and they looked at an organism and they did their observation with photos and then they decided to take one sample home to make a spore print and key it out at that point after their spore print was made, which usually takes between three to 12 hours. And they just haven't got back to make the identification yet, including their observation pictures of the mushroom as well as their spore print, which they'll add in later. The other thing is perhaps the observer is new or it's confusing as to what kingdom it belongs to, but perhaps it's a new wild organism. Maybe when out in the field, the observer was taking an amazing photograph of an organism, organism. 
they found a flower and they were taking a picture of the top of the flower, the bottom of the flower, the top of the leaves, the bottom of the leaves, the stem, the whole plant and the habitat where it was growing. And then lo and behold, a pollinator came along and pollinators fly away. So they right away as quick uploaded their flower picture and started taking photographs of the pollinator. And they got as many bee pictures as they possibly could before it flew away. But then they didn't go back to the first picture of their flower, so it became an unknown. And so therefore, that is why identifiers are so very handy to get caught up on some of these unknowns. So what happens when it, an organism becomes part of casual grade? Perhaps it's lacking evidence of an observation. So maybe it doesn't have a picture or a sound recording uploaded. Perhaps the unnaturalist community just disagrees with the date. Something like seeing a June rose in December, that just doesn't work out very good. Or maybe there's a disagreement with the location and someone has in their observation that there's whales living in the prairies and that just doesn't work out either. Another reason why it might remain in casual grade and not go to research grade is if the organism is not wild and perhaps there's a palm tree in Saskatchewan or another um, organism that just doesn't isn't native here if they are trying to do observations in Saskatchewan and this could be anywhere so if the organism is not native to that location it will stay in casual grade. The other reason it will be in casual grade if the observation is just not a living organism. iNaturalist is designed to capture and try to identify living organisms so if someone has submitted a picture of a rock or water that just doesn't work on iNaturalist and there are other apps for rocks, but iNaturalist is not that one. The other reason is that the iNaturalist community thinks that the identification is just not recent, or if the iNaturalist community doesn't have two-thirds of the identification community agreeing on the species level. The other reason is the iNaturalist computer vision technology is very good at figuring out what is nearby. And if there are many, many genuses marked nearby as not wild and that they are naturalized genuses, then at the iNaturalist computer vision system will mark it as naturalized and not native. And so that organism will stay in casual grade and not get to research grade. So the one of the reasons why it's important to look at research grade and species level is because those things go to the global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF. Research grade helps to improve the computer naturalist artificial intelligence, and anything research grade going into the GBIF helps other scientists worldwide to look at phenological changes, and if climate change is affecting the range of species, or how soon it's coming back in the spring, or anything else like that. Research grade observations flowing into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility are invaluable. GBIF also takes natural history collections and citizen science databases globally into the GBIF and it's a wonderful tool. So what is the solution to doing identifications on a naturalist? Even if you have never done an identification before, or perhaps you're not a specialist scientist. One thing is to look at the magic and the power of computer vision. Computer vision does not see the uploaded photographs of organisms like our human eye does. The computer finds patterns in arrays of ones and zeros and compares those to patterns in an existing database and all these ones and zeros are compared and then iNaturalist will make a suggestion. Justin Williams on iNaturalist mentions to use caution when clicking on the agree button when you get to species level. Research grade, as mentioned, are sent to GBIF and are used to train iNaturalist's computer vision. So if the computer vision comes up with a suggestion at genus level and you're not confident on species level, it's fine to stay at genus level. However, if you push the compare button and the species level does compare well, to what iNaturalist suggests, then for sure you could go to species level or if you explore the taxonomic key for that species. 
And that's also fun to do. There is so much online right now so that you know what the characteristics are of an organism to get to species level. And seen nearby is another wonderful feature on iNaturalist, and it helps to improve the artificial intelligence as the computer can quickly figure out what has seen, been seen nearby, and that helps it to say, hey, we think your observation looks like one of these because other people have seen it really close, and these are very similar looking plants or animals. The other thing to remember when you're on iNaturalist is identifiers have a sneaky little trick that they can use that is a little bit over and above what computer vision does on iNaturalist. Only the very first photo is ever used by the iNaturalist computer vision. So even though we have been saying that when you are out in the field to take as many pictures as possible to help in the identification phase, that helps the human identifiers and it does not help the computer vision on iNaturalist. So as an identifier, please flip through all the pictures of the organism uploaded by the observer because perhaps the third picture is a little bit clearer than the first picture or by comparing all the different aspects of the organism, it helps you to come to an identification a little bit better. If you're an observer, it's easy for you to reorder the photos and as an identifier, you can't really do that, but it does help you to look through all the photos. Now, here are all the different kingdoms on iNaturalist attached to the uh, tree on iNaturalist. And so it's very easy. To, from a very young age, we've all been looking at picture books and we pretty much know if it's a bird or a mammal or an insect or a plant. And even just by putting in a course identification like that, it will help bring along the specialist scientists. So if you put in that it's a mammal, it'll bring along the zoologists and the animal biologists. If you happen to put in that it looks like a reptile, you'll bring along the herpers. If you put in a fish or a plant or a fungus and so on, you will bring out all the various specialists to help out with that identification. Now, these are not nearly all the specialist scientists that are around the world but it gives you a sample of some of them that may come along to help with the identifications in these areas if it started out by anybody helping out with identifications on iNaturalist. So as an overview of identification, there are different levels. If you are not certain about species level, only identify to the genus level. Even a general identification is good. Don't guess at species. Many arthropods or insects and mushrooms or fungi need microscopic examination. When in doubt, use a taxon key. It can be a lot of fun. On our particular user page on iNaturalist, as we find online taxon pages or hints and tips from other iNaturalist users, we post them on our profile. It helps us to go along in our identifications. And we have filled up our journal also with different hints and tips in our particular area. Sorry about that. First to identify, if you are the first one at that observation made by this naturalist user, extend a welcome with hints and tips. And that is a wonderful way to keep them involved and intrigued with thy naturalist. Add in a comment if Here's you some information. Add in a comment if you think it might be XYZ species, but you're not sure. Let an expert take it to species level. Now we're going to go into research grade a little bit more. Research grade helps to know what is it. Things to consider are, is the iNaturalist suggestion a good fit? Compare the observation with the suggestion photos, just by clicking view next to the suggestion or compare. Check out the iNaturalist suggestions for seen nearby. If you think the species is right, but out of its usual range, choose genus level and make a comment. Learn more. Delve into a bit more learning about this organism. Take the iNaturalist suggestion and read more about them. Discover what features are needed for that organism and if they are, if they are evident on the photographs uploaded. Compare the species to those in the Saskatchewan Data Conservation Center resources because Saskatchewan Data Conservation Center has resources for plants and another one for vertebrates and another one for invertebrates. 
and you can look at the genus level and you can see what is listed in the Saskatchewan data conservation for that particular genus. And sometimes you look out and there's only two species in that genus. And if you read up on two species, you have it made in the shade. However, if under the Saskatchewan Data Conservation Centre, there's 21 species under that genus level, that takes a little bit more research and it might be easier just to go to the taxonomic key. This is an identification model for iNaturalist. Again, we'll mention the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre species level. Listing, sorry. Uh, many provinces across Canada also have their own uh, con data centre with species level for the different provinces across Canada, as well as countries around the world. So knowing where that's located and comparing it to species level that are known already does help you with your research quite a lot, as mentioned. Check out this iNaturalist page for community guidelines. It's a wonderful way to show good form and engage in con conversations around iNaturalist that will be productive and helpful. This page also is a wonderful way to receive more answers for using iNaturalists, whether it's using the frequently used questions, going on the iNaturalist forum, or just emailing for help. For us, our particular user page is this one online, and you can pop in there anytime you want. Now here is an amazing page you will use a lot while you're doing identification. It is a good idea to upload this page just on a different tab while you're using iNaturalist in another window because you might be using it quite a lot. These are some of the table of contents on this page and it gives you just a wonderful answer to use. So if you come up to an organism submitted by someone and you see that this is the very first organism they have ever submitted to iNaturalist, you might want to pop in the paragraph about welcome to iNaturalist. And it gives some links and some hints and tips for this first time user. Or even if they've just got 10 or 30 observations, you still might want to extend a welcome. Maybe you have come up to a picture online where someone's taken a picture of their grandmother. Now here is a wonderful paragraph on this frequently used responses page. And you can say, yes, humans are often found in this part of the world and we appreciate your uploading your observation. However, iNaturalist is really more beneficial if you upload organisms that are like plants or animals that are also native to the area. Another thing that might come up is if the observation is this one. And here iNaturalist encourages people to upload, upload their very own photos and observations that they've seen in the field. So they go out in nature, either in the backyard of their house or to a park nearby, and they upload some insects, some plants and animals. And this is much better than taking a photo of a picture in a textbook or a picture on their computer that they've seen on another website. That could run into copyright issues. And again, on this page of frequently used responses, you'll find a wonderful paragraph of how to encourage this person to only use their own photos in the field rather than something that they see in a textbook or on another web page somewhere. Every once in a while on iNaturalist, you'll see a first time ob observer that's very excited about being on iNaturalist and they'll go out in the field and they'll see an amazing picture of a tree and then they'll push the plus and then they'll take a picture of a caterpillar and push the plus sign and take a picture of a squirrel that's nearby and so on. Now, this is wonderful that they're seeing all these organisms, but instead of submitting after each organism, they're using the plus sign, which makes it confusing for the identifier because you cannot give each organism its own species identification this way. So when you see multiple species or organisms in one observation, there is a wonderful paragraph here about how to duplicate their entries and put them all on their own page so that each species can get their own identification. And it's a win-win situation for the identifiers and for the first time users on iNaturalist. The other thing you might see is that someone has taken a picture of a caterpillar and then the caterpillar moves a little bit and then they take another picture of the same caterpillar and so on. So if you think someone's taking multiple observations for one single organism, 
you might want to use this paragraph for the observer and help them along. There's also a nice paragraph for encouraging people to take pictures of native or wild animals. On iNaturalist, we'll still put in the identifications of captive or cultivated organisms, but they'll probably remain at casual grade instead of going to research grade. Because on iNaturalist, there is a focus on native or wild plants and animals, fungi and insects, and so on, in that particular place of the world. So all of these things may come up at different times during your time spent identifying things on iNaturalist, and this page is very, very handy. So here we have three pictures on the screen, and try to figure out what you think the identification might be for each of these observations that you might bump into when you're do doing identifications on iNaturalist. We have sort of this landscape picture, a lady running down the beach, and here we have a picture on a computer screen. I'll just give you a moment to consider what your identifications might be. So for this first one, we might want to go to the frequently used responses page and pick out the paragraph that it looks like multiple species or organisms in one observation. We can write a comment to the observer. Were you really trying to figure out what this grass looking stuff was in the foreground or these little bushes or the reeds around the water or something in the background? Let us know and we'll try to give you an identification on something in this landscape looking picture. With this one, we would definitely have to say that looks like an observation of a human and use that paragraph from the frequently used responses. And here, even though it's an absolutely wonderful fo focused picture of a Harris's sparrow, which does happen to be a species at risk in Saskatchewan, it does look like it's on somebody's laptop, a uh, computer out in the field. So here we would use the paragraph to use their own photos and observations because something on a web page on their computer might be under copyright. For this particular observation on iNaturalist, the identification would be human because computers are made by humans. Now here are some other observations you might bump into when you're doing iNaturalist identifications. And here, what would be the response needed for them? I'll give a few moments so you can type in some suggestions in the Zoom chat feature of Zoom. So for this one here, you could ask the observer in comments, did you want the flower identified or did you want this um, caterpillar identified? Uh, if you have an idea of what it might be, you can make a suggestion that the flower looks like a curly cup gumweed and the insect looks like a yellow sunflower moth perhaps. Or you could just say, look on the frequently used responses page and pick out the paragraph for multiple species and organisms in one observation and mention to the observer, hey, if you would like both the flower and the caterpillar um, identified, this is a way to divide up your observations so that you can have identifications for both. And just ask the observer to put into his comment section that, hey, I've duplicated my observation. Could you identify the flower here and the caterpillar here? And then both will get a wonderful identification on iNaturalist and help specialist scientists around the world, not only for these yellow composite flowers, but also for the insect here. And it's very helpful. And in this picture here, it looks like we have a paw print in the snow. Now, even though we were saying iNaturalist is geared for those organisms which are alive, it is considered on iNaturalist that paw prints show evidence of life. So here you can put in an identification. So you can just say that it looks like the paw print of an animal. You can go down to a mammal level, or if you think it looks like a dog's paw print, you could even put in a dog. So those are the different types of levels you can use for paw prints. Now this last one appears to be a bone outside. So it also shows evidence of life, even though a bone is technically not alive. So here you can put in that it looks like an animal. You can say that it looks like a bone from a mammal. You can even go closer to genus or species level. 
It is amazing that on iNaturalist, there is a special project page for bones. And there are quite a few museums that have their data collections online with the sizes of bones, the shapes of bones, and quite a few bones that are uploaded to iNaturalist do get identified to genus or species level, which is really quite fun to watch the process. So after the City Nature Challenge, which takes place April 29th to May 2nd, and during the identification phase, we are going to have some virtual ID parties over Zoom. There might also be ID-a-thons or id hackathons. The difference between these is that an ID-a-thon or an id hackathon on Zoom are mainly geared to see how many identifications can be done in a certain Zoom time and with conversations between everybody that's involved on the virtual meeting. A virtual ID party is a little bit different and it depends on who's enrolled for the virtual ID party. If there are quite a few specialists online, it might turn into an ID-a-thon or an ID hackathon. However, if there are some beginners that decide to turn into the virtual ID party, they might ask for some guidance or some advice with where they have gone and what they are thinking that they should do for identifications. At some virtual ID parties, there might be a specialist there. At one of our virtual ID parties on May the 5th is going to be the Saskatchewan Mycological Society. And they will help us learn about lichens and tree conchs and other fungi that might be uh, put online as an observation. We also have a wonderful entomologist online from the city of Saskatoon who will help with insect identifications. Lichen and tree conchs, as well as insects, should be nicely woken up by April 29th to May 2nd. And so these would be wonderful specialist parties for a virtual ID party for you to come to, to get a little bit of advice or to ask some questions about some insects or some mushrooms and lichens in Saskatoon and area. So in summary, as iNaturalist curator, Sam Kieschik would say, you just cannot protect what you don't know. So getting involved with iNaturalist as either an observer or as an identifier certainly does help protect and enhance conservation levels worldwide. Sam also says, you get out of iNaturalist what you put into it. And it's fine and dandy to be an observer and stay at observation level. However, if you do both, become an observer and become an identifier, it's an amazing how much you will learn. Participation is definitely worth it. And here you can see, you can get out of iNaturalist what you put into it. And it's wonderful as an identifier to welcome other naturalists to participate. As they become interested in nature, if they get a little bit of encouragement from a wonderful welcome message, it just helps them to stick around and learn more about nature in the area. It does support vital conservation research worldwide. Please consider adding iNaturalist observations identifications all year long, even after the end of the City Nature Challenge. It is wonderful if this piques your interest and gets you involved with iNaturalist. Saskatoon and area will compete for the title worldwide of the most biodiverse city, and we need your help. The goals are to engage the public in the collection of biodiversity data on iNaturalist with three awards every year for the cities and areas that firstly, make the most observations, secondly, find the most species, and thirdly, engage the most people as observers out in the field. So as identifiers, you're definitely helping it to come to species level a little bit better so that that collection area of the biodiversity data can get a little bit closer to species level. So we're very excited to have this fun, friendly competition to place nature on the world stage for the City Nature Challenge this year. Thank you very much for attending this workshop online. And we are the friends of the Saskatoon Afforestation Areas, a nonprofit environmental charity here. This is our email, friendsafforestation at gmail.com. Our website is friendsareas.ca and our blog site is saintbarbaker.wordpress.com. And if you want to find us on iNaturalist, 
you just put this outside in front of our name when you're in an observation. And our name is Saskatoon Afforestation Areas. There is also a chat feature on iNaturalist as well to talk to people on iNaturalist. So if you want to become an identifier for the City Nature Challenge, the identification phase is May 3rd to May 8th, and the City Nature Challenge winners are announced on May 9th. If you have any questions, we'll stay online on the Zoom a little bit longer. And this is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much, and we hope you have fun on our naturalist. Being an observer in the field is a lot of fun. Coming along after between May 3rd to May 8th to being an identifier is also a huge help, as you could see throughout the workshop. And if you want to stay on board as an identifier later, it doesn't take long to flip 10 to 20 um, observations every day, and it sure does go a long way on iNaturalist. And you learn so much, not only locally, but around the world. It's kind of like being a virtual armchair tourist.